IRC, Jeremy Weiss here. I'm here with Ryan Lane, and he is the founder of Dream Beard. If you can't, you didn't notice his beard, it's fantastic. Tell people about your beard first. Man, I've been growing this luxurious thing for about five and a half years now. Okay. Yeah, man, I love it, dude. It, my wife's into it, everybody seems to be into it, so I just keep it. <laughs> so you started with $46. Yeah, man, it was wild. We left Ohio from a previous job, had no clue what we were going to do, and applied to over 400 jobs, didn't hear back from any of them. And I was like, I know what, I'll start a business with the last $46. That's the best thing you could do, right, to provide for your family. And, uh, you know, and somehow it worked out. We were on, we were living with my uh, father-in-law at the time. We started Dreambeard on the dining room table of his house, and it grew to where we were having employees, like with pop-up tables in the living room, while, while her dad was watching like American Idol. So it was a very wild experience. What was the initial idea? What were you gonna produce? So it was beard oil. We were the first person to ever create beard oil. So before then I had a little beard and I always would put like lotion in it and stuff like that. And my wife would be like, man, it smells like the inside of a dog's ear. Like you've got to figure this out, you know? And, uh, and so I had a bunch of just different um, weird thoughts in my mind over the past, over the past year before we started that just kind of gave me the idea. And I was like, you know what? Like, why not a product for beards? You know, that's oil based. And so that's kind of how we got started. It was wild. So I, I want to hear some of the challenges, but what, what helped it take off? Because you started on the kitchen table, essentially. Yeah, man. I think that it was definitely social media back when social media was really like rich, you know, like, so we jumped on Instagram and I was a, I was a musician for 10 years too. And I knew how impactful it was to get a, to get um, a musician or a band to like talk about something because everyone that they followed would just be into it. And so that was kind of where I really started. It was kind of before influencers was like a thing, you know? And so we hit that hard and within three months on Etsy, we were in 30 countries and our Instagram blew up uh, kind of almost overnight we were getting into six figure followers like within like a year wow. so yeah I mean it was just I think we just kind of hit the stride right and kind of had this game plan of like let's get you know people who matter excited about our product and then they'll kind of like talk about it for us so who was influential in helping that because you probably touched a lot of different influencers at the time so like specific influencers specific yeah types of, yeah you, know, you mentioned musicians i don't know if yeah. there's other categories of people that were yeah. influential yeah i think the biggest ones honestly were like zz top kid rock like those kind of dudes like were really big and influential um but really we never really hit too hard on any other sector for a while i would say that for the first few years we just kept hitting um people that we knew uh famous skateboarders you know all that kind of stuff anyone that at the time that had a beard we like were reaching out to them hard so what's your background as a musician? Uh, so I was actually a pastor for 10 years and wa walked away. Uh, some people would say I like lost faith, but I would say expanded. And, um, you know, and so I had always done like worship music and things like that and traveled the, the world. And How did you get into being a pastor? That was, uh, so I, when I was 16, I... I uh, was a hoodlum selling drugs and I was facing prison time, got kicked out of school and I was living with my grandma waiting for my sentence and she went to church and so I went to church and just if, I think at a young age I never had like, you know, maybe a role model to, to look up to and so the youth pastor really impacted me and it kind of just sent me on a spiral of like maybe this is what I want to do with my life and I just kind of was like and just kind of went into, theology, got a theology degree and did pastoral work for like a good 10 years, you know, and I still have a lot of respect for it. You know I mean? I don't really go to church anymore, but I, I have mad respect for it. And I think it gave me a lot of morals. And it also, I think really helped me a lot in my business because it taught me how to like interact with people in a real way, you know, and like get on their level and like understand them and what they're going through and try to meet those needs, you know? That's fascinating. So what made you decide to transition? So you've been doing it for 10 years, it's a long time. What made you transition from 
being a pastor to something else? It was really weird because, you know, uh, so I had married my wife and we were only together for about seven months or married seven months. And we were up in Ohio. I was a youth pastor. And it, initially it was like a, it was a, it was like a gradient, like a gradual thing. It wasn't like, I'm not doing this anymore. I think we just, we moved back down to Atlanta. We didn't have any plans. I kind of arbitrarily just thought I was going to be a pastor still somehow, or maybe find a church. And when that didn't happen, I was like, well, what am I going to do? Like I'll work anywhere. Like I got to do something, you know? And so I think Dreambeard actually was the catalyst. Like it, it just kind of happened. And I still worked in a church for like a while with that. And then as it grew, I was like, man, I can live off of this. And then I think it was just like a transition where I was like, I think this is just a new chapter in my life, you know? And so, yeah. So was your wife helping in the business too? Yeah, man, 100% still does. Like I'm, I'm here in Chicago. She's in Atlanta, still just you know doing it all, man. And we, so we, we've all kind of had our hands starting for $46 and everything. So she's capable of pretty much any operation at Dreambeard. But uh, right now she's more of like overseeing because I'm getting a lot more into like consulting and just like I don't know, I you know the podcast. Yeah, I'm just a face having the fun. The exactly, man. <laughs> Um, so I kind of want to hear about the products. Yeah. What do you guys have? Yeah. So we started out with beard oil. We have a very what extensive the, line. Yeah, you know, we yeah, we have like the lumberjack, the mechanic, the carpenter. That was the original three. Now we uh, we've we've branched out and done another thing with influencers. This was before influencers. Is we found a couple really key cool bearded guys and we created like special beard oils for them with like their face on it. So we have like the gentleman beard has my friend Justin on it. We have the bearded barber. It's like this famous barber guy. And, uh, and so we did that and now we do like a, a seasonal thing. So like every quarter we produce like a whole new scent, new product that's based on the season and it changes every year like the seasons. And, um, and so we do that plus like shampoos and conditioners and flex paste for your hair and hairspray for also for styling competitions and things like that. I've seen some of your, your styles yeah, yeah. on Google Images. Yeah. So yeah, man. And then also, and obviously, you know, we're more of like, this whole cultural brand really. So obviously we do like t-shirts and things like that. We've sponsored skateboarders and had skateboards made and things like that. So we, we've actually, we've done a lot of weird stuff. Lately I've been into grilling a lot. So we have a, we have a season, a seasoning called beard trimmings. And it's, yeah. and so we just do all kinds of weird little products all the time, you know, so. What are your personal favorites? So what do you like? I mean, obviously the beard oil is a staple for, for me, you know, uh, probably with the lumberjack or the mechanic, the two originals. Um, the Lumberjack is more of like a pine base, you know, so it's going to have like that kind of vibe to it. It's like sweet kind of. The musk, uh, the mechanics got kind of like that musk, but not musk in like the bad way, you know, but uh, <laughs> but musk in the good way. It's kind of, it's, I would say it's like the most natural you can get to like a cologne. So so some of the challenges, obviously there's been a, from $46 kitchen table, there's been a lot of upward trajectory. What's been some of the, the tough points? You know, growing pains, man. Like anytime you grow, it takes more cash flow. It takes more this, more that. Um, I can't say it on camera, but I'll get real gushy with you. I was working with a Fortune 500 company that was super exciting. I was going to be in every Walmart and Target in the world and worked with them for six months. And then they uh, actually ended up stealing our ingredients and just like really? leaving us. And we they left us with about six figure debt, a uh, little over six figure debt. And we it almost crippled our business. And we had to fight through that for like two or three years. And we actually just paid that debt off in April. So looking at that, that sucks. First yeah. of all, um, looking at that, is there anything you look back um, that would have triggered it? Like if you were going to another big retailer um, or is it just just happen because it happened? Was there any like signs that that was going on? You know, I was so naive at the time and I was just excited about the opportunities. I think I was lost in that and I wasn't being very mindful or like observant of the little things. I look back now and yeah, I definitely see some like telltale signs that you should be careful in business, you know, because especially, especially if you start having success, you're always going to have some wolves that are going to start coming out of the you know, out of the woods and they're going to start kind of sniffing you out and like, oh, well, how can we, how can we partner with them or use their like platform to better ours? And so you just got to be careful with that, man. I, nowadays I'm very relational. Anything that I'm doing with anybody, I'm going to know you very well. Like we're going to be friends and it's, it's a very relational business for me now. And you guys have a podcast uh, where people can check out interviews. So talk about that for a second yeah. and, and some of your favorites. Yeah, man. So we started a podcast uh, last fall called Life Gets Hairy. Uh, 
within the first three weeks, we were in the top 200 on iTunes. We landed at number 28, and uh, you know we've been doing well. We do we have about a half a million uh, followers or listeners, whatever you call them. And uh, yeah, man, some of my favorites are some of the weird ones, like the psychedelic psychotherapist, and uh, I've had like famous chefs on where we didn't talk about anything to do with food, but how he was uh, up in the mountains with his father and he almost died trying to hunt mountain goats and like, you know, crazy stories like that. And uh, yeah, I'm always like, most of the stories, if you see someone you know, a famous person, or maybe someone you don't know, don't expect it to be a story about what you think it's going to be about. I'm always trying to dig into something kind of really deep. You know, essentially what happened is being a pastor for 10 years, having a business, and then watching my dad go through cancer, having my first son. I was like, what is this all about? Like, what is reality? Why are we here? Does anyone know? Like, what happens? Why do we work so hard? At the end, we die. Like, you know, and so those are the kind of the... People are coming to to you for those answers, right? The youth pastor. Yeah, I mean, I'm starting a religion. No, just kidding. (laughs) No, but, but essentially, man, like, that's... That's it. It's like I, I want to be real with people, you know, and, and just have that real human interaction, you know. So. so, Ryan, from the youth pastor days, what are some of the toughest cases? Like, it sounds like you uh, needed some guidance early on and then you went to help. Um, what were some of the tough cases you had to help youth with in, in the youth pastor days? Oh, Dude, it's rough, man. I think I think one thing I realized in being a youth pastor is like you just don't understand like like even at this exhibit, everyone's got their suits on and stuff, but you just don't know like what in the world could actually be going on with someone inside or what they're dealing with. I've had youth that, you know, watch their that I had a I had a, a youth tell me one time uh, at a dinner, just me and him hanging out. He's like, he confided in me and I didn't know where his brother had been. And apparently like him and his brother were being molested their entire life by their father. And then he watched his brother shoot his dad in the face with a shotgun and kill him. And then he had to watch his brother go to prison for helping them get out of this situation. And it was like, what do you tell a kid like that? What do you tell a kid like that? You know? What do you, you know, at the time I still actually keep up with him. And, uh, but at the time, man, I was just like, look, like I think, that life is hairy and there is no right or wrong decisions and it's really terrible what you went through but I'm here for you like and you do have a real person that really does care about you now and you know we're going to get through these emotions that you're dealing with and maybe it's causing you to react in a certain way and and we're going to be be more mindful about this you know and I think honestly in the end it's love it's like just giving just be there for the person yes just be there and love people and I think even now with the podcast and everything it's like that's all I am and I've learned that like I'm kind of all things and we all are. We're all potential evil. We're all potential this. And it's like, we're all things trying our best to distill it down into love, you know? And so I just try to live in the moment, be here, be present, and love people. Yeah, and you come across like that. Um, You spoke today. Yeah. Talk about a little bit about what you spoke about to the audience at RC. Yeah, so I talked about uh, building loyalty through high-touch customer service, and we talked a little bit about the podcast and different things like that. Uh, one of the big ones was handwritten notes. So uh, this was obviously now it's kind of more widely used in the e-com world, but when we started, I had never seen anything like it, and I think I was just genuinely appreciative of people. And uh, so we all it wasn't like a business plan. We were just like, wow, but people really care about this because people will throw away promotional material, but I have people with notes that, keep them from like four or five years from the founder. Like I have a founder, you know, a note from the founder, you know, and, and it's a big deal for them. I've actually uh, wrote over a million myself, wow. you know, so it's it's something where I spend maybe even an hour a day still to this day in my office writing handwritten notes, so. it's amazing. So do you incorporate, uh, do you talk about the youth pastor in your talk at all or not really? I. I didn't this time because we just had such a small... You totally should. I, I think so, too. I think it's fun, and I think it's very unique. Um, but, yeah, I didn't have enough time in the talk to really kind of bring that up because I knew it was going to be like a can of worms, you know? So, <laughs> um, Where should we point people online for the podcast? Where should we point people online for Dreambeard? Yeah. Yeah, so we're real social driven. So like Instagram would be Dreambeard. Um, we do a lot of our Life Gets Hairy stuff on there. We do have Life Gets Hairy Instagram too, but we found that we already have like, you know, 200,000 followers on Instagram. Why, why try to create another platform? Let's just like, you know, use that one. And uh, But Dreambeard.com, LifeGetsHairy.com. Uh, you can find our podcast pretty much anywhere. You can search Life Gets Hairy on like iTunes, things like that. You know, so. so last question, Ryan. Um, a proud moment from his journey, you know, from youth to youth pastor to jobs to you founding this company or kitchen table what's been a proud moment 
Man, that's a loaded question. I think that my most proud moment is when I had my son and I realized that that meaning is created and that that success is subjective. And so I realized in that moment that I wanted to spend my entire life investing back into my family. And that's what really mattered to me. Like all this and all the business and all that, it really doesn't matter to me. Like I love it and I love my customers, but my meaning in life is my family. And so I want my ceiling to be my son's floor. And so that was my, my most proudest moment is watching my son being born. You know, I have to ask since you're a youth pastor, um, you know, how do you answer the question yourself about like you said before, you know, I walk around and, you know, why am I working so hard? Why am I doing all this? How do you manage that question from a, you know, short-term perspective? You're like, okay, why am I here? I'm going to just go to a Cubs game. We're in Chicago. Let's just have fun to, I need to grow my business long-term. Yeah. How do you balance that internally? So like, almost like the life work balance. Yeah, thing. exactly. Because if you, you know, if you go too far on one end of, well, you know, I'm working, why am I working so hard? I'm going to have fun. You can go to the fun end. Or if you're like, you know, what? I really want to provide for my family and move forward. You can go too much on the work end. Yes. So where do you think, where you fall in the spectrum and how do you balance that in your, in your head? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question because, and that was actually a hard lesson I had to learn because for a while when I was going through all those emotions and I was like, you know what, screw all this. Like, I just want to be with my fam and I want to love and all this kind of things. I, I got, I, I probably got too much into the, the work, uh, out of the work life. I was like, life was like way up here and work was down here and it showed in our business for a while. And I noticed that and I was like, oh man, like, well, we got to pay the bills. Like we live in this reality, whatever it is. Like there's, you know, we've created this where you have to have pay bills and have a life. And so that was kind of a perception shift for me. I was like, okay, well, here's my, here's what, here's how I, how I kind of actually identify it. It's like, what do you actually want in life? And so for me, it was family. So I look at family, right? And then I think to myself, okay, that's the goal. So what do I have to do? So I have more time with that. And so that's kind of how I balance it is like, I know I've got to do my stuff and I know I've got to be diligent and I've got to work hard, but the, the reason why I'm doing that, and I think that's what's so imperative is that you know the reason why you're doing that is like, is so that I can be with my family or maybe it's you have a hobby or maybe it's whatever it is, you wanna be with your friends, you wanna travel, like you gotta identify that and then understand that's why you're doing that so that you can have more of that. All right. Live from RC, fantastic. Check out Dreambeard and their podcast. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much, man. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.